Our Father and our God, we want to thank you and praise you because we know you love us. Father, we want to praise you because we know you will never forsake us. Thank you for bringing us to the meeting today. Thank you for your power in our lives. Thank you for the miracles you have done. Thank you for keeping us all through 2023. Thank you for bringing every one of us to 2024. Thank you despite all the trials and problems and difficulties you are there for us. We are very grateful. Father, we commit this meeting into your hand. We pray as we want to go into the meeting, we pray that your Holy Spirit will lead and direct us through. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Like I said, once again, I want to thank you because God has brought us to the new year and happy new year. And I want to welcome every one of us to the first summit of uh, Sharp for 2024. And uh, what we are considering today is the vital key for ministry in 2024. The vital key for ministry in 2024. Ministry is what Jesus started and he continues to do through us is ministry. The ministry is like a key. And when you look at the motive of key, key has always been recognized as a symbol of power or authority. In another way, key is only given to people that are judged to be trustworthy. And when you look at key, compared to what the key opens and closes, key is very small. And what it does is so big. Key to the save, key to the gate, key to the door, you see that they are very, very small, but what they are able to achieve with their size is so enormous. He can be compared with gavel that we have in the hand of the judges. With the gavel in their hand, they can command a man to die. With the gavel in their hand, they can ask that man to be alive. He is as strong as that. He suggests power. He suggests exclusivity. That is, is exclusive to doing certain things and working things out. And key is something that goes with mystery. In fact, Isaiah described key in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. He said, then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. And when he shuts, no one will open. So again, we see in that place, in that verse of the scriptures, he is a symbol of trust. In the hand of the one that gives it, you give the key to somebody that you trust. You trust somebody, you give him the key to your safe. You trust somebody, you give him the key to your house. You trust somebody, you give him the key that he can open and close at, at will. And then the one who receives the key is a symbol of responsibility. In another way, key can be mismanaged. Because if you look at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the lawyers, according to what we are told in Luke chapter 11, verse 52, the Bible says, Jesus was talking to these people who said, you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not even enter in, and you hinder those people that are planning to even enter. So, Key controls access. 
the lawyer should have gained knowledge and shared this knowledge with the people, but they held it to themselves as a result of that. The people couldn't go there. And that is what uh, Jesus Christ was making us to understand. You remember again when uh, Peter spoke in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 all through to 20. Peter confessed Jesus Christ as God, as the one that has the identity of Christ. And Jesus Christ said, According to this circumstance, according to this confession you are given, you are granted the key of the kingdom. Heaven and earth are under your control. Whatever you lose here on earth is losing heaven. And whatever you bind here on earth is bound in heaven. That is telling us about the, the usefulness of the key. And uh, when we are looking at the key to ministry, I just want to look at just one particular character that the Bible mentioned, that people that don't have that key, they don't have their life, may settled in them. When you look at the drunkard on the street, what are they missing? Is this key? What about the students who go to school and they, they are not able to stay in school for a very long time? What are they missing? Is the key. And what about the people that normally come out and they come late to every appointment? Is the key. The compulsive eaters, why are they having this problem and this difficulty? It's because of the key. What about the smokers that they couldn't deliver themselves from the hand of smoking? Is the same key. What about those people that were given to pornography? and they are so banned into it, and they can't deliver themselves out of the hand of pornography, is because they lack this key. Those drug addict people who die, who, they hear about somebody who has died of it, and they still continue to do that thing, what is the problem? Is the key. Why is there that so many Christians are not growing, and they don't spend time alone with God? The problem is this key. All these people lack this key. And what is this key that we want to look at that is going to help our ministry in this new year? It is the key of self-control. Let me explain the key, explanation of this key. Because if we don't understand the explanation of this key, it's going to really affect us. What's the explanation of the key? What is the key I'm talking about? The vital key to ministry is the key of self-control. Now, self-control is the inward rule or regulation that, er, that uh, of a uh, regulation of every area of our life under the ultimate authority and control of the Holy Spirit in line with the word of God. That is self-control. You are able to have a rule. You have a regulation over your life at the control of the spirit of God under the word of God. It gives you that key. It helps you. It assists you to be able to be what God wants you to be. I was reading the article of Philo, the Jewish writer who describes self-control as having superiority over every desire that is you are able to to, to you you have superiority you set priorities over every desire paul the apostle was talking about this key in titus 1 verses 7 and 8 he said overseer must be a must be above reproach as the steward of God. He said, overseer should not be self-willed. He must not be quick-tempered. He must not be addicted to wine, nor pugnacious, nor fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, 
the summary of all these qualities together is self-control. When the leader is having self-control, it will not be self-will, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of solid gain, hospitable, yeah, loving, yeah, sensible, yes, just, devote, it's all depend on self-control. When Peter was talking about it in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, Peter said that self-control is one of the qualities of a leader that wants to last long in the ministry. Now, let's now go on. So, because you want to please and honor God, you go against every feelings of the moment so that you can be able to fulfill what is the plan of God. Now, what is self-control? Number one, self-control is primarily inward and secondarily outward. That one means that the self-control we are talking about, Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, he made us to understand in Mark chapter 7, verse 21, he said, from, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thought, fornication, and so on, and so on, and so on. And Jesus now went further to say, all these evil things proceed from within and defies the man. So it follows that every desire, every evil desire, in order to, in order to be able to overcome, all those evil desires are coming from within the heart. But for you to be able to have self-control, self-control is the one that helps you to look at it inside and you are able to overcome it. It's a divine work that God has helped us to be able to get. You know, many pastors, they come out and they control themselves of uh, such evil desires in order to look good, appreciated, and avoid being prosecuted by the law. That's why they just keep themselves like that. And when you have that kind of attitude and then you just want to show that, well, I control myself, I'm well decent, I'm this, you are struggling with it. You are not just yourself. It's not the Holy Spirit working it in you. It's not the grace of God doing that work in you. It is you that is just trying to control the thing. A writer put it this way, he said, it's like putting a band aid on the cancer of the heart. When the heart is not thorough and you are struggling as a pastor, you are doing the show, the, the, the showmanship of the whole world, it's not going to get any, any result. So it takes divine heart to be able to walk in your heart to be able to give you self-control. Number two, self-control is not self-willed. But is connected to your will. In that Titus chapter 1, verse 8 that we read, Paul said that, that elders is to be self-controlled. When you come to verse 7, Paul says, elders must not be self-willed. It means that both of them are connected to responsibility of our choices, of our will. But the difference is that self-control person is submitting to God, submit himself to God. But self-willed person is acting on his own selfish desires and he's disregarding what God says. That's the difference between the two. Then number three, what is self-control? Self-control is not legalism. And I tell, you know, when you are legalistic, you are trying to earn a standing with God by perfection of certain duties and behavior. You want to look spiritual to other people. So therefore, legalism makes you to be man-made rules. And... Uh, you now judge other people who are not keeping those rules. That's not the standard of God. Look at what the Bible says. 
Paul the apostle says in second, I mean, first Thessalonians chapter two, verse four, Paul says, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our heart. So we are not doing this thing for a legalistic level, no. We are doing it because this is the will of God for us. We want to follow it. We are living under the grace of God to be able to do the work of God. We control it. It is even the spirit of God that is controlling us inside. Not that we are doing it by ourselves. He went further in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. And he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me did not prove vain. But I labor even more than all of them. Yet, not I, but the grace of God with me. That is it. So we are doing this thing because God has given us that grace and we are operating with that grace in our life. Now, having seen what self-control is, often look at Explain, explaining that key. We have been able to explain the key that self-control is not legalism. Self-control is not self-willed. Self-control, as we see it, is inward and then outward. Then how do we now have the expansion of self-control, of the key, the expansion of the key? Haven't seen the explanation of the key. Let's look at the expansion of the key. Now, you get self-control by working with the Spirit of God. And that's what we need to understand. We get self-control by working with the Spirit of God. And, uh, you know, you are living according to God's purpose for your life. So for us to be able to have self-control and be able to really, really maintain it in our life. You must have, number one, a life statement. There must be a life statement, a motto for your life. Take, for example, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God. That can be a motto for your life for the year. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And I mean, and his righteousness. All these things, including power. Healing, trust, finance, health, every other thing you are looking for, it will be added unto you. Jesus Christ himself even too has a life statement. So for you to be able to have life, I mean, self-control and be able to run it the way God wants us to run it, you must have a life statement. What is your life statement? Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus said, I, the son of man, I have called to seek them who are lost and to save them. That's what Jesus said. If you look at Paul the Apostle, in Philippians chapter 3 verse 8, he too has a life statement. He said, more than that, he said, I can't all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. That is, he, that is his life statement. Every other thing in the world, the trouble we see in the world, the finances in the world, the wealth in the world, everything in the world. He said, I counted them as nothing. So that I will be able to know the value of Jesus Christ, my Lord. By the time you jump from that place and you come to St. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, part B, it said, I press on so that I may hold to that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. I press on, I move on, that I may lay hold on that for which also I was laid hold of of by Jesus Christ. So he has that control. He has that thing within him that keeps leading him, self 
control. He was having, he was having a life statement. How do you be able to expand this key? Number one, through a life statement. Number two, through a life scheme. There must be a scheme. Paul illustrated this with the analogy of an athlete who wants to win. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, he said an athlete who wants to win run in a race so that he can be able to have it. So to get to that goal, he brings every area of his life under that purpose that I am going to win this race. I'm going to make it. So he controls his, you know, when you look at an athlete, they control their diet, they control their rest, they control their regular workout so that they can be able to move to the goal of winning. Paul said, let's do the same thing. Let's control ourselves. Let's move in the way that God himself has chosen for us. So that is what God himself has as us to do, self-control. Then not only that, self, how do we now expand it? We expand it, number one, by a life statement, which you need to make. Number two, by a life scheme, there must be a purpose. There is a scheme, there is a program, there is a syllabus you are following. Then number three, there must be a life signed up. You sign up for your life. Like a soldier who goes to the army, they sign up. They can go to that war and may not come back. They signed up their life. So a biblical goal will provide the motivation to change. You need to count the costs and be willing to commit yourself to it. That is self-control. Before you commit to spiritual goal, think about it, what it will require you, and whether you are willing to commit, to follow it through. That is self-control. Look at what we are told in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 4. It said, when you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it. For God takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. So, you see, you sign up. You sign up that this year, I'm going to be so and so to the Lord. This year, this is my achievement. Last year, this is what I was. This year, this is what I want to be. You sign up for it. You give yourself to it. Whatever happens, I'm going to follow this through because you are having a life statement. You are having a life scheme and you are signed up. You are signed up. Paul the Apostle tells us that his motive is to please God. Now, Paul says in Acts chapter 24, verse 16, he said, in view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience, both before God and before men. That is his uh, sign off. My conscience is going to be okay. I'm going to stand well. As a minister of the gospel, I want to make sure that I please God in everything. Then how do we expand this key? There must be a life specification. Number one, there is a life statement. Number two, there is a life scheme. Number three, there is a life signed up. Then number four, there is a life specification. You need to prioritize and schedule your goal. If your marriage or your ministry or your means of, uh, you know, Financial means, uh, you know, acquiring more knowledge of God is falling apart. Maybe because you have a bad temper or your tactics are wrong or your timing is having some problems or your, 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 how do I put it now? Your, 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 your tenacity is weak. If all those things are there, maybe you have a bad temper, you don't have the tenacity to stay, you don't have the tactics, you don't have the timing, you should be able to make it your priority, specification, controlling your negative goals should be the top gear of your goal. Now, 
Paul the apostle says in Hebrew chapter 12, verse 1, he said, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, he said, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin we so easily entangle us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So whatever action you have this year by the grace of God, let's put all those uh, plans into action. And we make sure that we take a few minutes every week or two to evaluate the progress we have made. Okay, take for example now, today is the last Sunday in the month of January. So one is gone out of 12. So we have 11 to rattle with. We have 11 to do all the plans that we need. When we started in January, we say, oh, it's a very long year. We have 365 days. Out of the 365 days, many days have gone. 28 has gone out of 365. And we know that the whole thing has, is just crumbling down and crumbling down and crumbling. Before you know it, December will come by the grace of God. And let's make sure that all the corrections we need to make, we get it done. Galatians chapter 5. Verses 16 and 17 says, But I say, walk in the spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. You will not do the desires of the flesh. He said, for the flesh set his desire against the spirit, and the spirit set his own desire against the flesh. For these two are in opposition to one another, so that you may not be able to do the things that you please. If we do not conquer the desires of the flesh, you will not grow in godliness. You don't need, you don't win a war accidentally. You win that war by devoting yourself to the battle and you are committed to fight with everything in you unless one will not be able to win that battle. So these are the essential things that we need to do. Number one, we have known First, the explanation of the key. How do you expand the key? Have a life statement. Have a life scheme. Be signed up. And then have your own specification that this is what I want to do. And I want to achieve it as a minister for yourself, for your family, for your ministry. We need to have a specification. Now, let me look at the exigencies of the key. The exigencies of the key. Now, this key is needed in every aspect of our life. It is exigent in the ministry. And it is the divine control. And this divine control has to be in the following areas. Number one, in our body. The Bible says, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 tells us there. So how are you to have self-control in your body? Number one, you need to have a proper rest. Avoid extreme workaholic attitude. And at the same time, avoid extreme laziness. If you have that, you are not going to really have, uh, if you don't control that, you're going to have a problem. It means that you need to have a proper exercise for the body. And apart from proper exercise for the body, you need to have a healthy diet in a moderate proportion. You eat healthy, you work well, you don't fast to the detriment of affecting your, your body. At the same time, you don't eat to become glutonous. You balance your life, you put everything right. You don't eat junk food. You don't go to, I don't know, Ada Chipule or whatever name they are calling it, uh, Burger King or whatever it is, or Burger, Burger, Burger Queen, whichever. Whichever one. You don't eat all those junk foods. And you don't get yourself overweight. Controlling your body also requires godly control. And it affects you. Controlling your body also requires you control yourself over your sexual desires. God made those desires to be there. But you control it. But he designed them to be resisted to marriage. 
So you, you, you control yourself, you control your ministry, you control your body, you control everything concerning you. So that is number one. Number two, self-control goes with the mind. Our culture, more than any other history, is bombarded through the media with all ungodly ways of, to think and live. To be godly, you need to control yourself in this age because the media is just bringing all kinds of something into your something. If you look at your phone, you are flipping your phone, you see all kinds of things that are coming in. Now, Paul the Apostle gave us the key in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, how to make our mind set you. He said, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So to control your thought life, control what you read. Saturate your mind with the Bible and books that can help you to grow in godliness. Set some goals. Reading through the Bible in the year, that is a very good goal. Or trying to read some Christian books in a month, that is very good. So control what you expose your mind to. The TV movies, the internet, everything, control that. You control your body, that is number one. You control your mind, that is number two. Then you control your emotions. The Bible makes us to understand that our emotion is very, very important, but you are not helpless victim to your emotions. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30 says, a trans." A, a tranquil heart is life to the body, but passion is rottenness to the bone. When your heart is settled, you get life in your body. You control your body. So you are not yielding constantly to the emotions that you have. And if you keep on constantly leading to the emotions you have, you are not going to grow. And self-control means controlling your emotions for a higher goal. You look at something that's of a higher value, you go there, you attend to that one. That is what self-control can do concerning our emotions. Matthew 4, 24 says, The news of Jesus Christ spread about all Samaria and everywhere, and they brought all those people that are sick, sick in the body, sick in the mind, sick everywhere, and Jesus healed them all. They were you will know if if you know your emotions is having problem. Let's carry that emotion to Jesus Christ so that it can help us through. We have talked about our body. We have talked about our mind. Now we have talked about our emotions. Let's go about our time. Many at times we have excuse over our time. We say I don't have time, and I can't. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for this. I'm so busy. That is true. But somebody was saying. He said, but we have time to do what we want to do. If there's a thing you want to do, you will create time for that thing. And the question we are having within us is that as this year is going on, do you have time to be godly? So if you want to have time to be godly, you cut out all unnecessary things in your life and you focus on those things that is good for your life. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 17 says, I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man for a time for every matter and for every deed is there. Because God knows that he gives you that time. Whatever you spend your time on is what you are going to be judged on. Then we go to finances. You control your finances. We often complain that we don't have enough money to pay our bill. That may be right. But let's alone, giving to the work of God, well, that may be right, but all the same. We usually, the problem is that we do not properly manage our finances, what God has trusted into our hand. Many people run their credit card in such a terrible way that it leads to poor financial life in their life. Some things you don't need to buy. You just go to the store and buy, 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 buy. I remember when I was leaving Boston to come over to Memphis here, there are, in fact, two third to three quarter of all those things that were in my house were not necessary at all. 
they were not necessary. The attender, I just scratched so many things. Some brethren came and took so many things away. When we got over here, the little we have and the small we are able to carry with us before our load came from Boston was sufficient for us. When the load from Boston even came, I was telling my wife, I said, ah, and we have been used to, because those loads came very late. We became used to just having small things in the house and we are just enjoying ourselves. So when the other load came, we are now looking at, is are this load even necessary? So we don't need to, if you go to your house and you want to do, uh, what do you call it, garage sales, you will see a lot and a lot of stuff that is there that you are not even using. There are clothes that you buy in your wardrobe that is still there till tomorrow that you have never worn one day. So let's make sure, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you didn't buy clothes. I'm not saying you didn't do what you need to do, but let's make sure that we guide our finances. Don't spend money for what you don't need money for. Don't do anything that you don't need that one for. No, make sure that you do everything according to the will of God. Use Matthew 6, 33 as the basis. He said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. When you seek the kingdom of God, all other things will follow you and it will be fine with you. Then finally, you take control of your tongue. That's where uh, we need to be very, very careful. Take control of your tongue. Abusive speech or tearing other people down like guests is a sin. The Bible told us that in Colossians chapter 3 verse 8. Angry word is a sin. As Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 tells us, lying is a sin. As Ephesians chapter 5, chapter 4, verse 25 tells us, when you are talking inappropriate about sex and telling dirty jokes, it's a sin. It shouldn't, we shouldn't hear it from a minister. Ephesians 5, 3, and 4 tells us about that. Gossip and slander. Ephesians 4, 31. James 4, 1. Taking the lost name in vain. I mean, joking with the, names of the, with the name of the Lord. Exodus 27 condemns that. Matthew 6, 9 condemns that. So, what is the way to control our tongue? Ephesians 4, 29 says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear you. So let's make sure we control ourselves in all these areas and some other areas like our relationship, like our dealing with our with unbelievers. Like uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, associating with people, our social life, everything. Let's put everything under this beta key, because that is the key that opens and closes the gate of blessing for us in the new year. To be able to have a successful ministry, there is need for us to work on this particular key. I pray that God Almighty will help every one of us and God will assist us as we spend time to, 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 to seek the face of the Lord and uh, to depend on the Lord to see what God will, you know, do for us in the new year. Once again, I say thank you and uh, I wish you happy new year. We're going to spend